guns to put them away and really make them look great. And we're all supposed to be here. Uh, that's why I'm here. We're not doing this on YouTube. Uh, and uh, so thank you for putting the computers away. That's nice. I don't even think we can take notes because they're recording all this. You'll be able to see it on YouTube tomorrow. So. <laughs>
encourage as a sort of advertisement for a kind of blue, uh, uh, Eastern blue, uh, that uh, we love to get applicants from yeah, from Ohio State, and I want to say that um, uh, we are better for it, and I think the students who come from Ohio State, so I want to encourage you uh, to uh, apply uh, the deadline. Is, uh, that's why I'm really here recruiting. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the person to see about that is Jeff Kipnis, because he's the conduit. He, he puts the yay nay on the application, so he says yes, you get in. So, uh, and he also has Ohio State tickets, so it's a good thing. <laughs> but uh, seriously, uh, it's uh, great to be back here. Uh, I guess it, but for the wrong reasons, obviously, I'm here to watch a football game. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm hoping that Ohio State does not go to the national championship this year. I'm sorry to say, but the last time I was at the national championship, it wasn't fun. So uh, we should take a few years off. Uh, <laughs> uh, just for a while. So, uh, another anyway, I'm going to uh, do something uh, different than Adam does. I know architects are supposed to show slides. Uh, so I'm going to show the latest slides I have for, for projects that's been building now for uh, six or seven years and we continue to build. Uh, it's one of the largest projects that we've ever done. This is the city of culture in Santiago, which is done in Spain. But I don't want to lecture on the slides. I want to, uh, since uh, I come from the East, I, I want to talk about uh, some of the things that I see in uh, architecture. Uh, I uh, would like Tunics and headdresses like 
they look like Egyptian servants, let's say. They, they, they would come right out of Aida uh, costume. But anyway, there were 16 men that had holes on their shoulder. Uh, and on their shoulder was a platform that they were carrying. And on that platform was uh, Paul Trost, the Nazi architect's model of the House of German art. Uh, a, a model that must be uh, at least 30 feet by 20 feet. I mean, it was an amazing model that had to be carried by 16 men. And what it sh showed to me was how important architecture was to the regime. I mean, that, that first of all, they would make a model this size. Second, they would have it in a, in a, in a monumental parade with 16 men carrying, uh, 16 people dressed as Buddhist Buckeye carrying the School of Architecture. No, uh, impossible. Uh, but it's really interesting how celebrated architecture was in this particular culture. Of course, it was part of the whole mode of, of propaganda of both the, of the Nazi regime, of the Italian fascist regime, of the Russian communist regime. So uh, I suppose that I've never seen a president in this country, perhaps except Thomas Jefferson, who was very much interested in architecture. Deal with 
problems of architecture today, both for people who are teaching, people who are practicing, uh, and people who are learning uh, about architecture. And uh, they are points that for me are, are, are important, and I, I want to share them with you. And in fact, there are six, but the sixth is so arcane that I'm only going to talk about five. So when I stop at five, don't say, me the sixth. Make that everybody says that. Uh, it really should be six, but if I did the sixth one here, you'd all say, well, what's going on? So I'm cutting it to five, so I should have said five points, but the trouble is, I think somebody liked the Perkins GA had. So I say six. This is a uh, I was on John Stewart. Uh, uh, point one concerns the possibility of architecture in our media culture. Media has invaded every aspect of our lives. It is difficult to walk down the street or stand in a crowded elevator without encountering people as far as in a, in a big city, uh, speaking into cell phones at the top of their voices as if no one else is around. I am always reminded of my apartment building in New York. We get on on the 17th floor, the people who come on on the 15th floor, and then immediately they check their blackberry or they start talking on their cell phone. I think to myself, why did they do that before they got in the elevator? It seems something about being in elevators that people want to turn on their Blackberries or plug in their earphones, and, and etc. Amazing. Uh, they have, and it absolutely changes the culture of being in an elevator when people get in and, and start talking on their Blackberries. Uh, their iPhones provide instant messaging, email, news, telephone, music, uh, etc. There's even a site now that I found uh, my students something called Eisenman 08, which is a group of, of nuts from around the world who are proposing me for president. Uh, <laughs> it's a, a Facebook site that I can't even access. <laughs> I urge you all to join up after. Uh, now, the iPhone provides instant messaging and all that stuff, but it provides you as if you were attached to a computer. That's the problem. That is, the real world has turned into a virtual world. The less and less people are able to be in the real physical world, i.e. in architecture, without the support of the virtual world. So that we're becoming less and less ne necessary as architects providing uh, physical support for our virtual being. This has brought about a situation in which people have lost the capacity also uh, in terms of time to focus for any length of time. This is partly because media configures time in discrete segments. Focus is conditioned by how long one can watch something before there is an advertisement. In newspapers, stories keep getting shorter, the condensed version is available on the internet. I hardly buy a newspaper anymore. I get all my news and I plug in to CNN, bingo. Uh, I have all the headlines, I don't need any more. If I need information, I plug into Wikipedia, which most of my students do. All of my student papers seem to be right out of Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, it, the sort of thinnest of all uh, layering of information uh, we all fall victim to. Uh, we get the condensed version of, of, of books, Sales of books and magazines continue to decline. And this leads for me to a corruption of what we think of as communication, with a corresponding loss of the capacity to read or write correct sentences. Now, this was written before the nomination for vice president, so I was not referring to this was written in, in uh, July 26, so uh, I'm sorry before the convention. But, uh, seems to be very prophetic, uh, if I do say so myself. Uh, while irrelevant information multiplies, while and when irrelevant information multiplies, communication diminishes. If architecture is a form of media, it is a weak one. 
now to combat this over-reliance on uh, other medias, architecture has had to resort to more and more spectacular imagery. Shapes generated through digital processes become built icons and have little value since they are infinitely varied. And of course, uh, the new idea of parametric processes uh, leads one to uh, ask many, many questions. Forget Photoshop and, and Rhino and Maya, etc. The what I call the new instrumentation that leads to new means of performance, etc. But I was on a jury at Harvard uh, last spring, and a thesis jury, a whole year's worth of work, and the student got up and uh, said, uh, I have written a, um, a, an algorithm, and he showed this, you know, as I said, we all have signs, and there was this uh, formula, I didn't know what it meant, uh, and, he, and everybody clapped. Uh, <laughs> and he said, from this formula, I can produce an infinite variety of variable forms. Infinite. Uh, and I thought, oh, okay. Of course, they all look like these uh, chicken coop forms that you've seen that everybody's producing these days. Uh, these punctured forms. Why they all look like that, I don't know, since uh, it's supposedly infinitely variable. Could I have one without punctures? And, you know, they look strangely at uh, So, uh, you'll get the, the, the sort of punchline. So, I said, uh, how do you choose? Oh, he said, choosing is unimportant. Uh, anyone will do, because it comes from this uh, algorithm. Uh, okay, uh, I thought, you know, I'm, I'm old fashioned. I said, you know, some of these look better than others. Doesn't matter how they look, uh, they're all the same. I said, okay, so then, of all people to ask, what's the function of this? It was me. And I fell victim to my own uh, anxiety. Uh, and I said to this young student, because he had this beautiful site in the middle of Hong Kong Harbor at the former site of the Kai Tak Airport. So I thought, wow, these forms that he's making, look at these things. It could be a museum, a new Shinto shrine, uh, a government building, something symbolic, you know, at least, okay. Uh, I think maybe it should be symbolic. So I said, would you tell me uh, what, after a year's research at Harvard and the thesis, what is the program? Of course, what a dumb question for me to ask. What do I care what the program is? <laughs> so uh, he said, it's a golf driving range. <laughs> I said, golf driving range? And I said, is all of this uh, algorithmic proficiency Necessary to produce a golf driving, you know, a golf driving, man. you stand with the club, you hit some balls, and then, <laughs> oh, he said, here you don't. Because what we do, you hit the holes uh, are set up so that uh, if you're a good uh, hitter, you hit through the small holes, and if you're not a good hitter, you hit through the big holes. And I said, where do the balls go? They say, they go into the harbor. <laughs> we have these boats. Uh, for all of you that are not in ROTC, 
see. Uh, uh, you will be in the Army three days after you graduate, as I was. Uh, you would all become very much less passive, right? Uh, it's the only thing I can think of that would, in fact, uh, induce some form of uh, energy into uh, a generation that can't help this passive. And it's the more and more that you become passive and you don't realize it, the more you demand uh, more stimulation. In other words, if I'm not performing well enough, some of you are already going to sleep, some of you leave, etc. In other words, you demand uh, more and more active, uh, energized participation, startling visual and oral information. Uh, in a state of passivity, people demand things that are easily consumed. And we have all become, uh, all of us, consumers. The more passive people become, the more they are presented by the media with supposed opportunities to exercise choice. Well, you have to look at these presidential debates and you get a clicker, uh, or you enter into a law and you call a number with uh, commercial rates, by the way. And uh, you can voice what you feel. And you, with your clicker, you can say yay, nay, up, down, etc. We're all voting on stuff that's totally irrelevant, but we think we're participating. Uh, when in fact, we're being lulled into a further state of passivity by this ersatz, false uh, level of participation. Uh, we vote for what news story we want to hear. We vote for what popular song we want. Uh, American Idol is an example of this. Uh, this subtle charade for me is merely another form of sedation because voting is irrelevant. It is only the byproduct of a hypermediated culture. It is part of the attempt to make the public believe that they are participating when in fact they are becoming more and more uh, passive. Students have also, I believe, become more passive than students in the past. This is not a condemnation, but a fact. To move students to act or protest for or against anything is rather impossible. They rather have a sense of what I call entitlement. That is, my students look at me and say, uh, why should I learn what you are teaching? Or you owe me this to get me there. The student and workers' protests of, for example, 1968, which I was involved in, seem impossible today. And particularly for the last seven years, we've had a government uh, which has fostered this uh, passivity, I believe. Our reputation in Europe, and this was in July, our dollar, our economy, uh, which has gone into the tank recently, was in, as far as I was concerned, was in the tank a year ago. Uh, and the spirit of what we stand for uh, has been weakened, and we don't realize that. In such a state of ennui, people feel they can do little to bring about change. With the war in Iraq, with our draining of our economy, there is still the possibility in this country that the political party responsible for today's conditions will be re-elected. Will this have consequences for our country? Uh, point three. This passivity, uh, the, the, the capacity of us to uh, allow uh, a continuation of uh, a form of government is directly related to architecture in that one of passivity's most insidious forms is the computer. The architects used to draw by hand, volumes, shades and shadows, select perspectives. Learning how to draw, for me, when one began to understand not only what it was like to draw Palladio or Le Corbusier, but also the extent of the differences in their work. And for me, you can't be an architect uh, if you're sitting at a computer in some 250-person office connecting dots uh, 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 with lines on a computer. You're not thinking spatially. You're not thinking in terms of the organization of space. You're not thinking of what I call a party. You can't do parties on a computer. You have to draw. And a party is a kind of diagram uh, uh, idea. And to 
me that no amount of Maya, uh, Rhino, or uh, uh, 3D Studio, uh, Photoshop is going to take that away. And what's interesting is uh, what I find in my, my students are they're very proficient at the instruments that they have to use, but they have no capacity to understand how do they bring them into play to make uh, architecture. To me, what a drawing did, what a wall section of Palladio did that felt different to the hand, to the eye, and the mind than one by Corbusier is that the differences were about ideas. One learned to make a plan. With a computer, one does not conceptualize an idea in drawing. By clicking a mouse from point to point, one can make a plan, change colors, material, and light. It's a photo, Photoshop is a fantastic tool for people who do not have to think or do not have an idea about architecture. The problem for me is as follows. My students say, so what? People in your office don't draw, which is true. Uh, I ask my students whether they know Maya and Rhino. If they don't know Maya and Rhino, we can't hide them. I don't want people in my office drawing. So they say, hey, we want to get jobs. Why uh, studying Palladio is going to help me get a job? And they're right. It is. In fact, it's going to hinder you uh, for getting a job. Uh, the implication, even at an elite institution like Yale, is if it's not going to help me get a job, I don't want to do it. Uh, and I think that is a, a pervasive and insidious problem that uh, I think our schools have got to take into consideration. That in fact, the world out there is demanding, and especially, let's say, state university architects to go into the system uh, to continue to feed the system. Somebody's got to run the computers. Uh, you would have thought that at a, a school like Yale, where we don't have that responsibility, that wouldn't be the case. It's exactly the same. So the question is, why does one need to go to Yale and spend $40,000 for an education where you can get one for 15 or 20 here? Uh, I think it's a very good question. Uh, and uh, the fact that architecture has a Di disciplinary history seems to be unimportant to what these students are thinking uh, about a future. In a liberal, capitalistic, market-driven society, getting a job matters, and for many students, it is the only reason that they are in school. Yet, education does not help you get a job. Uh, in fact, the better you are in Photoshop, the more attractive you become in an office. If I ask a student today to make a partee, which I do, and my students avoid my design studio, I should say, like a play. So, uh, you know, uh, they buy them up easily, so I always have to have some, uh, which is good. Um, but for me, when I say make a partee, a diagram or a plan that shows an idea of a building. In other words, when I say we're doing a Nazi documentation center, what is the architectural idea that is going to be operative in the, in the thing? I don't want you to show me a, a layout. We're going to go from this room to this room to this room to this room to this room, which has nothing to do with an idea. I want to know what is the idea of deployment of this material, right? And uh, uh, they can't do it. Uh, and this is a very difficult situation because I teach third year students. So, what we have to do is to go back to the beginning and say, uh, did it matter to Borromini when he did uh, uh, San Carlino or San Ivo to great churches? Did it matter how the program functioned? Do we know uh, how the communicants felt or the celebrants felt about the mass in these places? Did we worry about lead certificates or uh, sustainability about, they seem to have sustained themselves very well over four centuries. Um, do we know what the client was like, whether the Pope was a fascist or not? 
uh, clearly we don't care. The history of architecture has not been made up of LEED certificate uh, sustainable buildings. In fact, some of the worst buildings I know are done by architects who practice under the name because they can't design. Uh, they can give you a LEED certificate. Uh, so much for the history of architecture. Uh, uh, I suggest to all of these people that they go to Borromini. And Borromini conceptualizes an idea. It's nothing to do with the liturgy. He conceptualizes an idea between the column and the wall and the continuous idea of surface as opposed to in Alberti's uh, uh, Palazzo Rucelli or Alberti San Andrea or Palladio, etc. Borromini tries to transform architecture and thus the liturgy of the church into some other uh, condition. That is, produce an architectural idea of a building. Uh, uh, to me, that's why we're in school and that's why we're teachers, and that's why architecture could matter. Uh, point four. The computer is able to produce the most incredible imagery, which become the iconic images of magazines and competitions. You want a competition, you've got to be able to do Photoshop, you've got to be able to do, because people are only interested, the juries are really only interested in looking at images that uh, um, are so-called spectacular. You go into offices and I see a lot of offices where more and more spectacular work supposedly is being done and I wonder uh, if it is in fact architecture. Now, uh, when I say that we have these spectacular images, but these icons uh, have little meaning or relationship to what I call things in the real world. There was an American pragmatist philosopher, C.S. Peirce, the beginning of the century, who called uh, forward three categories of signs, icons, symbols, and indices. The icon was a sign in architecture that had a visual likeness to its object. A symbol had an agreed upon meaning. Uh, for example, Robert Manchuri's famous dictum categorizing buildings as a duck or a decorated shed cast the difference in architecture between an icon and a symbol in architectural terms. A duck is a building that looks like its object, a hot dog stand in the form of a giant hot dog, or in Venturi's terms, a place that sells ducks uh, taking the very shape of a duck. This visual similitude produces what first calls an icon, which can be understood at first glance. It doesn't take anybody any longer to decide when they see a duck that it, it ain't a city hall. Venturi's other term, the decorated shed, refers to a public facade for what amounts to a generic box-like building. The decorated shed is, in Peirce's terms, a symbol, which has an agreed-upon conventional meaning. A classical facade symbolizes a public building, whether it is a bank, a library, or a school. Today, the shapes of buildings become icons, i.e., without any external reference, that is, to a, an algorithm rather than something out in the world. That is to a virtual condition without, without a real program. They may not look like anything or they may only resemble the processes, i.e. the algorithms that made them. In this case, they do not relate outwardly but refer inwardly. These are icons that have little cultural meaning or reference. There is no reason to ask our more famous architects, why does something look like this? There is no answer to this question, because why is the wrong question today? Why? Because the computer can produce it. One could ask these our architects also, why is this a better one of these? Which one of the crumpled paper buildings is better? Which one is the best and why? The answers are problematic because there is little value system for judging because there is little relationship between the image produced, the icon, and anything external to it. 
These icons that made through algorithmic processes have little to do with architectural thinking or with what I call the persistencies of architecture. That is, enclosure, interior space, corners, interior corners, exterior corners, uh, all kinds of things, facades, plans, etc. We always are going to deal with them. Uh, what's the problem with the corner? Very few people today keep in this approach, especially with block buildings, because they don't have any corners. Say the corner doesn't mean anything, and since they don't have any plans, they don't say, they say we don't need to know plans. One of my colleagues, Mario Carpo, an architectural critic and historian, has written an article called Thinking from Al Alphabets to Algorithms. He suggests that in order to understand algorithms, one has to switch from thinking notationally, as in alphabets, to thinking algorithmically. If one uses algorithm, computer algorithms in the same manner one uses a three-dimensional notational system, one fails to understand the logic of the new technology. So one is not condemning the new technologies. One is saying is they bring to it the possibility of a whole new thought system that then reflects back into architecture. In other words, we cannot think notationally but algorithmically uh, when we are asked to work uh, on such equipment. Point five. It brings us to what I consider to another problem that I face and some of your teachers face, but that you may not face today. And that is the moment in time which we find, the, the real moment in time we find ourselves in. Edward Said, a, uh, a, a late philosopher, uh, wrote a book called uh, On Late Style. He describes in that book lateness as a moment in time when there are no new paradigms, nor no new ideological, cultural, political conditions that cause significant change. Uh, lateness can be understood as an historical moment, as an internal search for which may, which may contain the possibility of a new or future paradigm. For example, there were reasons in the late 19th century for architecture to change. These included changes in psychology introduced by Freud, in physics with Einstein, in mathematics with Heisenberg, and in flight with the Wright brothers. There was a movement from the mechanical era of the 19th century to another more complex condition uh, of the world. These changes which occurred, took place in the late 19th century caused a reaction against Victorian and empirical styles of that period and articulated a new paradigm in modernism. In each historical style, uh, you will find, if we go back in history, an early phase, which in modernism was from 1914-39, a high phase, which in modernism occurred uh, when it was accepted by capital from 1954 to 68, uh, and then uh, a period of opposition or mannerism where one struggles against that paradigm. This is what followed the watershed moment of the events of 1968. 1968 saw an internal implosive revolution, one that revolted against the institutions representing the culture. This was followed by postmodernism's eclectic return to a language that seemed to have been the deconstructivist architecture exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in 1988. 1988 put an end to this cliched and kitsch style. But that was in 1988. We're now 20 years on. What has happened to change anything? Nothing. In fact, uh, the reason that we have not had an avant-garde and everybody wants to be avant-garde and everybody thought that with computers we could return to the avant-garde, you cannot return to the avant-garde if there's no cultural condition that promotes this kind of thing. So there is ultimately a relationship between architecture and culture, between the discipline itself and, and the cultural conditions uh, that uh, are influenced by uh, the discipline. Therefore, I would argue that we 
we are not in an avant-garde, a high moment, or a mannerist moment, but a fourth moment, which Said calls a late start, uh, a period where there is no new paradigm, in which one tries to find a way to uh, produce work uh, without resorting to uh, uh, either a mannerist, a high, or a, as it were, a uh, digested form of mannerism. Computation is a possibility to produce a shift from notational form to digital form, but in itself is not a new paradigm. The question remains, what happens when one reaches the end of an historical cycle? A beginning, a middle, and a mannerism, and then nothing new happens. Um, Late style describes this woman in color that you all face, uh, I believe, before there is a shift to a new paradigm. A moment not of faith or hopelessness, but one that contains the possibility of looking at a late style for the possibility of the new and the transformative. Said cites in his book, Late Style, Beethoven's Mises Solemnis written at the end of Beethoven's career, where the composer was responding to the seeming impossibility of innovation. Instead, <clears throat> Said says, Beethoven wrote a piece that was difficult, anarchic even, that could not be easily understood because it was outside of his characteristic and known style. Beethoven's later work, Said says, is an example of the complexity, ambivalence, and undecidability that characterizes a late style. These few notes toward Edward Said are to suggest that this is not the moment of the news. While everyone, many of us, want to be avant-garde, looking into the old, into architecture's own discipline, and into its history may be one way to deal with today. For me, late style has an analogy in literature in Thomas Pynchon's most recent book, Against the Day. His story begins in 1893, set at the Chicago World's Fair, the Great White City, which was conceived at the time as an image of the future. So this is, in a sense, uh, the book is all about an analogy uh, comparing 2006 with 1893 and suggesting that uh, what seems to be the future uh, became the past, really, but had the possibility of the future, but we didn't realize it in the way, uh, because of the way we looked at it. So he said that the White City was conceived as an image of the future, but instead its classical buildings was an architectural conservatism. It represented the end of an era. Pynchon purposely sets his book in the late 19th century to demonstrate that this is, that it was a late moment in history, but that there were stirrings of a future that remained unable to be known or seen by because of the way people thought of what it meant, the future. Uh, he caricatures this with young people flying around in fantasy spacecraft that had never really existed at the time, but that he imagined to exist at the Chicago Fair. These stood for the possibility of a useful, youthful transformation of the world, looking not at the classical architecture, but elsewhere towards new possibilities. Against the day, for me, is a parable of your position in the world uh, as I see it. It is the possibility of not looking at what is supposed to be the new and relevant in culture, but rather looking into uh, the discipline itself, like Beethoven did, to see what other possibilities there are that might, in fact, uh, become a future. What Pynchon sees is the fact that there is going to be a different form of infrastructure, of transportation, a different form of thought that would eventually transform the world and that its beginnings are apparent in the strangest of places, that in moments of lateness. 
these few words that I'm saying to you today uh, are merely to uh, provoke you, to suggest that, no, we're not in a moment of the new. No, I can't teach you answers to the future, the past, or even today. Uh, yes, I know you all yearn to be avant-garde, as I did, but I understood that I was following from people like the Corbusier and Mies van der Rohe, and all I could be was a mannerist, uh, rather than a, a, an, an original avant-gardist. And I believe that it's possible to look at the conditions that we find around us, uh, both in the past and in the present, into our own discipline and into its history as a way to begin to accept today the possibility as Pynchon saw it and as other architects of their time saw it uh, as a way to deal with the future. With that, I'm going to show some images which are not to suggest that I have the answers but the fact that I build architecture uh, as well as think about architecture and teach it. Uh, and I want to think that uh, this work is a late work. I am 76. Uh, I've been on the stage a long time. Uh, it is probably the largest project I will ever do. Uh, it's probably going to take the longest amount of time that I've ever worked on a project. Uh, and uh, it's probably the most expensive project I will ever do. Uh, it, it's built in the most uh, the backward region of Spain. Uh, it is a cultural center where there is little culture. Uh, it contains six buildings, uh, two uh, museums where there is no art, two libraries where there are no books, uh, an opera house where there is no opera, and a research center where there are very few people researching. Uh, this is what we call the buildings. How they'll be actually occupied, uh, I don't know. Uh, the whole notion of the project is in fact uh, to encourage uh, tourism to a region where in fact there is uh, very much a, a, a religious tourism today. A million uh, Catholic pilgrimages come to Santiago because it's one of the pilgrimage centers, uh, Rome and Jerusalem being two others. It's one of the few uh, uh, religious pilgrimage sites in the world. As a matter of fact, it has uh, the third most number of tourists uh, to St. Peter's and one other in the Catholic hierarchy. Now, uh, I'm going to press this. Uh, this, I'm not good at this. Uh, here goes me. Uh, let's move that. Can we, can we do that or not? and the 
Parthenon uh, and the Acropolis is one. Now, I must confess something, that I never used this slide until I was in a uh, debate with Rem Koolhaas, and uh, you might know who he is, and uh, he now leads off his lectures with the Parthenon, and uh, so I thought, I, I would use my lectures on Parthenon. <laughs> he says, uh, he's thinking, this is architecture, a very noble statement, and I couldn't agree with him more. Then he shows the second slide, he shows Frank Gehry's Los Angeles Concert Hall, and he says, this is not architecture. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, I, I can't do that because I love Frank, uh, but uh, Rem doesn't seem to care. Uh, and, and then he shows a building by Jacques Herzog, another one of his friends. He says, this is not architecture. He goes down a whole list of people. Uh, he has me in there somewhere. Uh, I'm only fifth or sixth on the not architecture. <laughs> but, but then he gets to one of his buildings, which seem to be like all the others. But he says, this is architecture. <laughs> um, you can say anything these days, as long as it's uh, not spoken in uh, correcting the sentences and get away with it. Uh, uh, this is the Alhambra in, in Granada in Spain which is a complex of buildings. And uh, the whole idea for, for us was to try and find a way to uh, take from a single building, which is a symmetrical building, and reach out into uh, the city and the landscape. So that is to create, in a sense, a, a complex of mega buildings that does something to the urban environment uh, that the single building may not do. Uh, next, please. There you see it. Uh, uh, in its context, the, the starting with the single building, the symmetrical center with the, with the circle within the square, and then how these buildings reach out uh, into uh, the landscape. Next, please. Uh, this is a famous example, uh, the Campidoglio, uh in Rome by Michelangelo of 1546 and 47. This was done under the, in a sense, the reign, the very short reign of, of Pope Sixtus V, who decided that one needed to make a series of points in uh, the city fabric, which was medieval at the time, uh, that allowed one uh, to understand where the religious places were, like the piazza in front of St. Peter's, the Piazza del Popolo, the Piazza in front of Santa Maria Maggiore, uh, the Spanish Steps, and the Campidoglio was the first uh, urban project of a secular nature. This was the place where uh, the secular government of Rome uh, uh, occupied uh, a, a very prominent point uh, in the city with these three buildings. They are just off the axis of the Corso, which is runs here, which runs from the Piazza del Popolo down to the great Victor Emmanuel monument. And of course, the lesson for architecture is uh, that ne not necessarily axial buildings uh, create uh, places in the city. And of course, the, the, the comparison between the Victor Emmanuel over here and the uh, Campidoglio by Michelangelo is stunning uh, in the contrast. Next, please. Here is the Escorial uh, in Spain, uh, built shortly after Michelangelo. It started as a church building, and then uh, a library, and then uh, a residence for uh, Charles II. And this was the model uh, that the president of the region of Galicia uh, said that he felt like he, he was like Charles II, uh, <clears throat> and that Charles II sat in a chair on his hillside somewhere over here to watch the, the building of, of this uh, project, uh, which was not completed before his death, and, and my client said that he wanted a chair to sit on the hillside to watch the uh, building of his uh, Escorial. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is, a, again, a very important uh, project in its urban implications. 
This is the Hofburg, uh, the Imperial Residence in, in Vienna, which is a, ser a complex of buildings which continue uh, to grow and, 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 and modify the city. And you get all kinds of things. There's a symmetrical building here with an axis over here uh, and a, a, a propylaea here with an axis here. And there are a series of axes that uh, are added and, and, and denied uh, as the Hofburg spread from the 13th century uh, to the uh, 20th century in Vienna. It's one of the great examples of how a series of buildings can begin to define urban space. Next, please. And the last one of these complexes, which I think uh, <clears throat> both show you the, the good and the bad of, of this, is the Getty Center in <coughs> Los Angeles uh, by Richard Meyer, an attempt by a single architect uh, to make a structure of, of difference and, and urbanity. Uh, and uh, so, Realizing the, the positive and negative points of this, we undertook this city of culture, this uh, six building project in Santiago, Spain. Next, please. Um, here you can see uh, the project um, in its uh, present state of construction. Um, to tell you, this is an archive building here. Uh, this is a the, a the local national library. This is a, a museum of cultural history. This is a research center. And then there are two buildings starting up here. This one, the Opera House, and a, and a Kunsthalle, or an international art center. To show you the scale of this project, this is an arena of uh, 12,000 people. Uh, this, uh, which seems to be dwarfed by these buildings, uh, the buildings are a uh, million five hundred thousand uh, square feet under cover. Not to mention all of the uh, rest of the, the project. Next, please. This is the competition model which we uh, set in. Uh, it, in fact, is a hillside, uh, and what we realized was this, this project was conceptualized as a response to Frank Gehry's Guggenheim Museum, which was an individual building which brought tourists to Bilbao but sucked all of the energy out of Bilbao. <coughs> what we wanted was a building complex that didn't look like a series of buildings but was a filter, that is, a series of passages four pilgrims on their way to the actual Church of Santiago uh, that uh, this would be a mountain mountainside cut into by these passages. So what we did was to cut the top off the mountainside and rebuild it as buildings looking like the mountainside with these path passages. Here is the kind of diagram that we sent in, which shows a, the Cartesian grid, the topological grid, and the medieval grids of, of the city of, of Santiago. This was a strategy purposely intended to be anti-monumental, anti-Bilbao, uh, anti-figure ground, as it were. And in fact, it was the only project that did this. Everybody else did these fantastic six building complexes. And we did this sort of dumb uh, model that didn't look like anything. Next. <laughs> um, these are the diagrams that we made. Uh, this is a diagram of the old city of, of, of the pilgrimage routes through the medieval city. Uh, we took these pilgrimage routes and placed them on the top of the mountainside. We then deformed those pilgrimage routes uh, by the topographical uh, energy so that we had a trace of the original roots and the topography of the land pushing the, the actual uh, imprints up. And then using the computer, we had a series of topological vectors that uh, en entered into the structure and finally uh, the Cartesian grid. 
So we had the medieval, the topographical, the topological, and the Cartesian all superposed uh, on top of one another uh, to make a complex and, as it were, uh, illegible reading. In other words, we wanted the impossibility of saying, well, that's the old town, or that's the topography, or that's the computer, or that's the, the Cartesian grid. We wanted all of those possibilities uh, simultaneously. That's what makes it uh, a late work. Next. Uh, there's the site plan uh, with the uh, medieval roots in brown going through all the way down uh, to the town. So this is a, a filter, a transition uh, that you don't even have to go through. It's very similar to our idea of the Wexner Center that from 17th and Fraternity Row, you have to walk through the Wexner Center to get to the football game. Uh, you didn't have to ever go in it. Uh, but you knew it was there. Uh, and that was a purposeful gesture. Uh, and um, uh, I know that uh, President Gee has his uh, uh, football lunches at the Wexner Center, uh, which is, uh, you know, you have culture and football at the, at the same time. We, here you have religion and uh, art at the same time. Uh, you don't have to go into the art, but you know it's there. Uh, next, please. We then wanted to make this project as contextual in terms of material and idea of spaces uh, as we could without being imitated uh, and being uh, merely uh, a, a, a replica of downtown. So these are the arcades that you find downtown. Here are the arcades in the building. Next, uh, these are the stone buildings that you find. Uh, we used the same stone. We couldn't get. We didn't use tile roof, but we used a, a red stone uh, on the roof. Same kind of uh, what's called quartzite. Quartzite. Uh, we used it in a uh, a Cartesian manner here, very similar to the way it's laid up uh, in the uh, houses of the region typical to the region you can see. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is the pavement of the central square, which uses uh, at least three different kinds of stone with the Cartesian grids uh, into the uh, stonework. And here we see uh, the Cartesian grid and the different stonework uh, in the uh, plaza pavement. Next, please. One of the things that's characteristic of Galicia is it rains a lot, and so in the buildings the, there is, are always these glass balcony overhangs to try and bring more light into the buildings because uh, of, the, of the climate. And so we, all of our project, uh, with the glass in the buildings all protrude out in several different layers to try and catch as much light uh, as we can and articulate uh, the facades. Next. And this is one of my favorites because this is uh, the facade in the harbor of La Coruña, uh, the port city of Galicia in Spain. And here's a picture of a three-level glass facade uh, that we uh, have uh, in our buildings uh, which try and catch, as it were, a feeling of this articulation in a contemporary idiom. Next, please. Here is the uh, History Museum seen from down below in the city. Um, and you get the idea that you know when it's got its tile roof, uh, it will seem like one of these. Uh, very interesting, the slope is the same uh, that it looks like, in fact, the uh, hillside, the continuation of the hillside. Next, please. This is the same building seen from above on, on top of the hillside. Next, please. Uh, the same building before its tile uh, roof had gone on, uh, kind of like a back one. Uh, we built a regular roof, uh, and then a 10-foot high gridded structure so that 
you could have all of the stacks, the exhaust systems, air conditioning, anything you want that's on the roof, but that the roof would not show this, and it would just have a second roof, which was all the, the local stone, so it would look uh, like a natural landscape. Next, please. And there you can see the, the research center with its Cartesian grid cut into the various local stone uh, and the uh, history museum in the background. Uh, it's very stunning to come up and see this building. It seems to warp and twist uh, and have no uh, stability uh, at all as you move uh, around it. Next, please. And there's the site. Um, the uh, archive building, the library building, the building we just saw, the, the research center, and the history museum, and the beginning, as you can see, of the opera house, which will fill in uh, and complete the hillside, and the uh, uh, International Arts Center. Next, please. Another shot of up close of the uh, library and archive, I mean, yeah, library and archive building. Next. Next. Here you can see that grid that uh, is uh, on top of the actual roof, which needs <coughs> this kind of, of roof structure. Next. Which you can see in place here. Next. These are interior uh, of the uh, library building um, with its three-layered uh, glass facade. Next. Uh, and you go from the glass facade in an upper level here to this level down to the uh, rare books room. So there's a, a, a kind of sectional continuity uh, for me, which is very important that uh, it is not a a, a single level, uh, but is a certain spatial continuity from above down below. Next, <clears throat> and here you can see it now uh, in a more finished form uh, with the, the this is in the interior glass facade, the exterior glass facade, the upper level, the second level, and then down uh, to uh, this uh, lower uh, level. Next. Next, and you can see here this lower level and the section uh, through it, and looking back through to the archive building. Next, this is the scale of the space, and again, this very complex facade and interior facade. This is several facades <coughs> of the uh, History Museum. Next. Uh, the sectional drawing next, and the diagram that allows uh, all of the uh, lines of the uh, typology, the topography, and the Cartesian grids to inflect upon uh, the, uh, all of the levels, both the horizontal and vertical levels of the project. Next. I show these because these are the last a uh, few slides that we've taken. <coughs> um, no, no, you're going to go, no, go back. <coughs> Too fast. No, almost done. No, there you go. Uh, this is not a, an illusion, but for some reason there's a glass floor in the building. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't tell you why. Uh, but they built it. And uh, you get this kind of photograph. Uh, and, and that kind of effect when you're there, that is this virtual uh, reality of sort of walking on nothing, uh, which is uh, for me quite interesting. And um, uh, we've never done that, we're able to do it before. And uh, I, I don't, can't tell you why, but it makes a nice picture. Next, uh, here it is again, over here. Uh, Next, and again, uh, with the traces of these uh, different uh, grids uh, in the uh, space. Uh, it really has this quality of, of, of being lost in the fun house. Uh, you don't know where you are, but you're seeing uh, 
Uh, here is another, you know, mirrored glass which shows you a reflection of the door that's over here. It has mm -hmm. and, and of course the double actual structure. Next, please. The interior uh, space of the uh, archive building. Next. Next. Uh, next. Totally tell I'm fascinated by these pictures. Uh, no, 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 come on, let's go on. Uh, I wanted to say something about these two towers. Um, my friend John Hedek, who was an ardent Catholic and wrote a book of poems about Santiago, designed uh, two towers uh, for uh, Santiago. Uh, they were to be symbolic of a west facade of a church without a body, and he was, as it were, at the time that he designed this, dying of cancer, and um, he was one of the five architects, a very close friend, and on his deathbed, I promised him I would build this church without a body, the body that he was about to lose, uh, uh, symbolically. And what's wonderful about, these are his actual from his actual drawings. If you stand over here and look through these two towers, we framed them so that you see the actual west facade of the uh, Cathedral of Santiago, so that when the pilgrims are walking down here, they stop for a moment to look through this west facade without a body, they see the actual body in the history of uh, Santiago. Next, please. This is the, the facade at night. Next. Uh, and you can see what it does in, in, in differently in the day or the night. Next. 